it doesn't take an accident for radiation to be released from nuclear power reactors. In fact, every day atomic reactors are releasing the whole alphabet soup of radioactive elements routinely. But you don't know it because you can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't smell it. Three Mile Island is located near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the capital of Pennsylvania, as you can see here on this map, uh, not too far from uh, many major population centers in the eastern part of the country. About 4 a.m., the uh, operators lost control of Unit 2 at Three Mile Island, and uh, the accident uh, proceeded for four days. The reactor was out of control, and the operators really didn't know when and how they were going to get control of the accident. Everyone was told that there would be no possibility of health effects. This presents the results of our reanalysis of the lung cancer rates. The darker red colors indicate the estimates of the plume travel, and the green areas indicate the areas where the, they were the lowest doses. Uh, you can see that there's a very systematic dose-response relationship. The line in the middle of the graph is the average rate after the accident, and you can see that in the green areas, the rates are well below the average, and in the darkest red areas, the rates were the highest. With my colleagues, we represented citizen groups in Pennsylvania through the entire state in those proceedings. In those operating license proceedings, my colleague and I were forbidden by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to raise any questions whatsoever concerning either the probability or the consequence of any accident that was more severe than the safety systems were designed to withstand. We were forbidden to ask about accidents. We were forbidden to ask about the consequences to people and their communities. Not allowed. This has been policy and regulation for every nuclear power reactor licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission before and after. This is the Dresden reactor um, down here in Grundy. Um, this is Chicago right here. Uh, O'Hare is about here, and this is the lake that's right up here. Now, what would happen if there was a loss of coolant, either through terrorist or accident, in the nuclear plant, a significant meltdown of the core, and a release of that, uh, that radiation into the environment? This, this is 2.2 million people, the people in the red and the orange, the EPA uh, population advisory uh, guidelines about where they would have to be moved from because this area, like around Chernobyl, um, would no longer be inhabitable. This is a true threat to millions of people here in Chicago, and that you've got to remember there's 106 of these reactors around the country. Everybody's exposed. What I want to do now is to describe to you what would happen if there was a meltdown near Chicago and walk you through the medical consequences in some detail. 3,300 people would die from severe radiation damage within several days. What happens with severe radiation damage is what happened at the people at Chernobyl. They were called liquidators, thousands of them. They actually got liquidated because within a couple of days they developed severe tanning of the skin called nuclear tan. They got severe edema of their legs which actually swelled and the skin split and they died within a couple of days. I was born in uh, Belarus, a town called Loev. It's about 40 miles from Chernobyl. In the spring of uh, 1986, I was 10 years old. And the spring was exactly the same like all the other ones, beautiful. It was just unbelievable spring. Um, cherry trees were blossoming, but there was something else in the air, something we did not know, something we did not expect, and it was uh, Chernobyl nuclear plant has exploded. Two weeks later, mid-May, we were informed in school that we should leave. All the kids should have been evacuated, sent to the summer camps in Russia. I was in the third grade that time, and our third grade teacher came along with us. There were 35 of us. 30 kids out of my class had a thyroid problems. Four of them 
had to be hospitalized before the age of 17. Here I am, many years later, facing the fundamental problem of the humankind, to be a mother, to continue the humankind. That's the most important thing for any human. This choice has been taken away from me. And here I am, that's why I'm here. I don't want this choice, this right, to be taken away from anybody else. If it weren't for federal subsidies that have been constant and substantial for the last 60 years, the nuclear industry would not exist as it does today in the US. Just the research and development subsidies that the federal government has spent over a 50 year period, 57% of those subsidies have gone to nuclear power, $73 billion. Renewables got only 11% over a 50 year period and efficiency, which we know is the, one of the quickest ways to reduce our dependence on energy only got 9%. Where is the waste now? It's at the reactors where it was generated. The waste is entirely stored at what is called interim or temporary facilities, such as wet storage pools or outdoor dry storage casks. And we're 62 years into the nuclear age, and that first cupful of nuclear waste that Enrico Fermi generated has not been dealt with. The reactors like Dresden, like LaSalle, like Quad Cities that ring this city, are Mark I boiling water reactors by General Electric. And with this particular design, at the Dresden site alone, there's over a thousand metric tons of irradiated fuel literally sitting on the top of the reactor in a fuel storage pond. I can't tell you how exposed and vulnerable that fuel is only to suggest to you that these are sitting ducks and might as well have bullseyes on them today. This is absolutely insane that you have the ability to obliterate not only Chicago but the Great Lakes by a aircraft crash. Nuclear power's expansion will bring nuclear weapons proliferation. And when you talk about one, you have to talk about them both. And, and there can be no more serious threat to the life and the health of this planet than a large number of nuclear armed states in the future. It is indeed upon us to find out how to repower the planet. That is the task of this generation and the generation immediately following us. It is vitally important for you to have a positive alternative to offer. I would like to offer you a more hopeful view of our energy future, a one which is based on nuclear fusion, 93 million miles away, the most efficient nuclear reactor ever conceived and already built with no capital investment and no waste issues. Wind power is cheaper. It comes in at $3 million a megawatt. There is nowhere on this planet that you can build a nuclear plant or even start to talk about building a nuclear plant for $3 million a megawatt. It ain't going to happen. The American wind industry and the world wind industry have been growing at a rate of 25 to 30 percent a year. The transition to a post-petroleum world holds the promise of bringing with it an era of unprecedented peace and prosperity if we can power this world with renewable energy. A non-nuclear, non-petroleum future is within our reach. We have the tools and the technology to make this transition. We need only the political will to use them.